Okay, I guess it's, it's 9 o'clock, so I guess we better get started. We have a fair amount to cover. I made the mistake last time of having two hours of material for one hour of time. Uh, I've tried to prevent that mistake for today. Uh, so we're going to cover a lot of uh, what I meant to cover in the second half of, of last week. Um, namely, using this data frame that uh, we downloaded and suffered through uh, correcting to import into, into R. We're going we're gonna to use that data frame now to do some very, very crude RNA-seq analysis. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm just going to talk about some of the fundamentals of RNA-seq. We'll talk, talk about that more later on in, in, the, in the group, um, but just some high-level uh, conceptual ideas about how we should think about working with RNA-seq data. Um, so just to recap, uh, the link at the bottom of the URL takes you to the GitHub page. This slide deck that I'm presenting right now is there. Um, and that's useful if you want to follow along and run some of these commands because you can just copy and paste them uh, from the slide deck into R. So if you haven't done so already, maybe go get that, uh, open up the slide deck and open up R Studio. Okay. So um, last time, if you recall, we, we set our working directory in R to our uh, desktop. You can choose whatever directory you want. I just tend to clutter my desktop and that, that works out. Uh, well, sort of, I guess. Um, so that's done with this set WD, WD for working directory command. Um, so if you could do that, that'd be great. What we did last time was we used this download file function to download a file uh, from, from the internet, namely the GitHub repository that I've set up for the, for the group. Um, and that file, once downloaded, we, we set it to this, um, let me turn on the pointer here. We set it to this file name called genecounts.fix.tsv. Actually, last time we called it genecounts.tsv. This fixed file, um, I've also fixed it here at the URL. This includes the renaming of the, the column header and, and correcting that missing data. Um, so now we don't have to suffer through all the issues that we, we struggled through last time. So if you run this command, you'll download this corrected file to your desktop. Okay, so I'd recommend doing that. Um, once that downloaded file exists on your desktop, you can read, use the read table function, which ingests that data file that's on your desktop into a data frame. Remember that we have to tell it that there's a header. That's how you can use named columns rather than numbered columns in the data frame. And we also have to tell it that our collaborator is from Europe and they use commas to, de uh, to separate decimals instead of uh, dots. And if you run that command, if you copy and paste that command into, into R, you should be able to load up this, this corrected or fixed file into a gene counts data frame. Okay? Maybe I'll wait 30 seconds or 10 seconds or so and just uh, see if everyone has, is able to do that. If you have any problems, just let me know, because we're actually going to be using this data frame uh, later on uh, in the lecture today to do some basic plotting and analysis. Okay, well, I'm going to, it looks like everyone's chugging along and not having any, any issues, which is great. So once, once you load up that data frame, in the upper right-hand panel of our studio, there's uh, the objects panel, and you can double-click that data frame and actually open up the contents. And, and what you see here is there's a five column data set. The first column is the gene name, and the last four columns are the counts of reads that align to these genes under different conditions. There's two mock treatment uh, conditions, control one and control two, and then there's two treated experiments. Uh, you know, we're just gonna pretend, we don't really know what the treatment is, but some experimental condition, okay? So what are those counts? Represent, and this leads into a discussion about what some goals uh, of RNA seq really are. Is there anyone in the room that's never heard of RNA seq? Okay, great. I'll I'll, uh, uh, I'll I'll talk a little bit about what it actually is about. Um, but the basic idea is to use DNA sequencing technologies to um, get a sense of how many RNA transcripts 
mature RNA transcripts exist in a given uh, set of cells under a given set of conditions. So um, we'd like, we, essentially the output is for every gene, this is we're just showing the first 22 genes here, for every gene that we're looking at in a particular species um, under different treatments um, as columns here, we get counts which represent essentially how many RNA molecules were observed for that gene in that condition under the population, from the population of cells that we actually sequenced, okay? So the way this works, uh, and there's, there's some new innovations from different technologies, but the, sort of the traditional approach here is to isolate uh, typically mature RNA. So this is RNA that has undergone splicing. And we, re we make some attempts to remove DNA that can contaminate the experiment. We then fragment the, the remaining RNA to a size that is amenable to the sequencing technology that we're using. And then here's, here's a critical first uh, source of potential bias. These first three steps are uh, sources of potential bias as well. Maybe only certain types of mature RNA molecules uh, sort of survive this isolation process. And when we remove contaminating DNA, maybe that biases against certain mRNA molecules as well. But when we uh, reverse transcribe into complementary DNA or C cDNA, that also can have, you could imagine that could be a somewhat biased process. Maybe the secondary structure of the mRNA molecule, certain mRNA molecules prevents them from being converted into cDNA as, as readily as other molecules. Here's another source of error. Then we ligate sequencing adapters. So we have to add a certain concentration of ligase, uh, a certain concentration of adapters, and maybe certain types of molecules just don't, don't readily ligate uh, adapters as well as others. Um, we do another round of size selection. We don't always have to do this. Um, and then essentially what we're doing is we're sequ sequencing the ends. Let me use this. Sequencing the ends of the, these complementary DNA molecules that we've made from RNA molecules. So this, there's so one of the things I want to highlight is there's a, this is a multi-step process. Each step can have biases that affect the ultimate counts that we observe in a given condition for a given gene. Moreover, once we have those, those sequences, we get a FASTQ file, which we haven't talked about yet, but I, I think some of you are familiar with. That's basically the, the output of sequences that we get from a DNA sequencing run. And for RNA, what we have to do is take that, that file of sequences and align it to a genome or a transcriptome so that we can get counts of reads that align to a particular gene in, in a Drosophila, mouse, human, whatever genome, whatever species we're working with. And it turns out that the simple act of aligning sequences that we get from this experiment to a genome itself has biases. Uh, certain genes are more difficult to align to. Um, the conversion of an RNA molecule to a cDNA molecule is error prone. So you might introduce actually some nucleotide errors that, that prevent those molecules from properly aligning to the right gene. All in all, what I'm trying to get at is the counts that we actually get at the end of the day for each gene, for each condition, aren't necessarily the truth. They're an approximation of the truth. We have sampling, you know, we're sampling a certain set of cells. Maybe those cells aren't totally representative of all the cells in the tissue that you're interested in. There's all these molecular biases and there's these sort of bioinformatic biases that might um, make those counts that we observe slightly different than uh, the truth, okay? And that gets into, I think, a, a sort of a fundamental concept in um, data science and statistics and uh, many aspects of, of medicine and, and biology. And that is this fundamental difference between accuracy and precision. Um, I know you have the slides, but does anyone want to take a crack at what they think Accuracy is? It's okay if you don't, it's early, but anyone might have, want to take a crack at what precision is? What's, what's being precise? Yeah. 
so yeah, how similar observations are, measurements are. Yeah, that's a very good uh, summary. Um, so, so accuracy is um, how close a measured value is to the actual truth. And related, but actually fundamentally different, is precision, which is if you take multiple measure, measurements over and over again, you put, you put a 25 pound weight on a scale, you get 25.00 pounds every single time, or sometimes you get 24.5, 25.5, .5, 29.14. .5, that would be bad when the truth is actually uh, 25 pounds. And this, this is a fundamental problem in biology. I mean, sometimes we can get very, very precise measurements, but they're not accurate at all, right? So um, a way to think about precision and accuracy, I think, that I really like is the concept of a dartboard. Um, I'm a terrible darts player, but I like to do it anyway. This is, uh, this is nothing, I could never do this. I could never hit the same basic spot on a dartboard three times, but if the goal is to hit the bullseye, these three throws are precise in that we're, it's reproducible. We can hit that roughly the same spot really, really well. Unfortunately, it's not the spot that we wanted to hit, right? So it's precise, but not accurate. Uh, this, this is sort of the opposite scenario where we're fairly accurate. We're getting close to the bullseye, but we're not consistent. They're not precise shots. We're sort of scattering all around the bullseye. This is probably the worst case scenario. You will lose every match of darts you ever play if you throw like this because you're getting it nowhere near where you want and we're not consistently getting it in any one place. It's just all over the board. And this is really what we want. We want precise throws that hit the same spot over and over again and we want them to be towards the target, towards the truth, which is the, uh, the bullseye. And just as an aside, I think one thing to think about is this notion that is thrown around a lot about precision medicine. Um, you know, if you go back here, do we really want just precise medicine where we're, we're uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's like on target, it's reproducible, but it has nothing to do with uh, the treatment that's actually needed. What we really want is precise and accurate medicine. Um, it's just a pet peeve of mine that the notion of precision medicine is a bit weird. Okay, um, so RNA-seq precision. What does that actually mean? Um, how, how could we go about getting a sense of if we're doing an RNA-seq experiment and we get these read counts for every gene in a given condition, how do we have any sense of if they're precise? That is, that the, the measurement uh, is reproducible and consistent. What's, a, what, what's one way of getting a sense of whether uh, an experiment is reproducible? Repeat, yeah. Do replicates. Um, traditionally, this is a technical replicate where you take the same material, you run the exact same protocol multiple times, and you, you expect, you really hope, that you basically get the same result every time. And if you don't, you learn something from that. That tells you that there's probably some fundamental problem with the protocol um, or, or the, uh, the, the um, biological uh, system that you're working with. So technical replicates, as I just said, we're really ideally starting with the same, same source. We do the exact same library prep over and over again. Um, whereas biological replicates, you're doing the same library prep and, and uh, sequencing protocol, but you're doing it from different starting material. So uh, condition one versus condition two, or uh, mouse genetic background A versus mouse genetic background B. Human one, human two, okay? So thinking about this, um, if we did two replicates, technical replicates, where we took the exact same material, did the exact same protocol, put it on the seek, locked it up to the sequencing core, put it on the sequencer. A day later, we get results from both of the replicates. If we counted, each point here is the gene. And we have the observed number of counts. 
read counts from this RNA-seq protocol for each gene from replicate one versus replicate two. And if, if, our, if our protocol is completely reproducible, and we did, you have great thumbs, great, great job on the pipette, you did everything great, listened to the same music, everything, you get this perfect correlation between read counts in replicate A versus replicate B, right? Does, has anyone ever seen something like this? Where it's like perfect? I haven't. Why? Why is it never that way? Right, there's variability. So what type of variability? Mm -hmm. Right, there's, you, you maybe put slightly different amounts of a given enzyme that's required in the protocol in replicate one versus replicate two, even though you did your absolute best to make it exactly the same. Um, maybe replicate one you did at the beginning of the day when you were super motivated, and maybe the replicate two you did at 8 p.m. right before you were wanting to go home and, and watch Game of Thrones or something, and, and you just kind of hurried through it, and it wasn't quite the exact same thing. So, um, what I want to show, so this is basically the concept of technical replicates. This is what we'd like to see. But I'd like to just show you that how we generated this plot. Um, oops, i got to get rid of that thing here. I don't know how to do that. OK. So all we're doing is creating what's called a simple sc a scatter plot. You have a set of x values and a set of y values. So the function to do this in R is called plot. Um, you have to give it. You have to define first what your x values are. Um, I've simulated this, so I've created a sequence that starts at zero and ends at a thousand and increments by twenty. So the first value, um, the first value is zero for x, then twenty then 40, then 60, then 80, et cetera, all the way up to 1,000. So this seek is, short, uh, is a shorthand for sequence. It just creates a sequence of numbers, and you can define what the increment. So if this was 1, it would be 1,000 numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 1,001 numbers, I guess. Um, and then we're doing the same. I did the same thing for y. So if x and y are always the same, 0, 0, 20, 20, 40, 40, you get this perfect correlation, okay? And then we haven't, we haven't talked about this. When you make plots in R, um, you can also define the color of the points, which is what I did here. You can define labels for the x-axis, so the x lab, label, y label. Um, and this basically, um, this is some cryptic R stuff, but it basically makes uh, the size of the points 1.5 times larger than uh, standard. Okay. So just I'm going to pull this out. If I can figure out how to do it. I can take that command. Oops. You're going to want to get rid of the greater than sign at the front of it if you mistakenly copied it like I did. Hit enter, and it makes this little plot down the bottom. That matches what you see on the slide. So scatter plots are sort of a, we'll talk more in more detail about different types of plots, but scatter plots, if you have two variables, a really nice way to just get a sense of the relationship or the correlation, association, whatever word you want to use, between two variables. Okay, so if, if we see this correlation, I, I guarantee you, you will never see something that is perfectly correlated, correlated like that in two technical replicates, but if it's pretty darn close, that's a good sign that things are working well. But it still raises the, the question of, whether what you're seeing is simply precision or s precision and accuracy. So you're reproducing the same counts in both replicates, but are, th are those counts, counts related at all to the truth? Um, and that, that second part is a really difficult thing to know. 
right? I mean, essentially, we're sort of trusting that the experiment, the protocol that we're following, doesn't bias the system in such a fundamental way that it's orders of magnitude away from the actual true expression of a given gene. Um, but in reality, that could happen. So any ideas about um, if you see that the te technical replicates appear to be precise, this nice correlation, how would you go about figuring out if it's accurate as well? Say again? A, a different means? Yeah, so a different experimental protocol? Oh, the biological replicate, yeah. So actually, yeah, if you see it across different biological replicates, similar expression values for, for the majority of genes, yes, that's a good way of doing it. Another approach that's often used is just an, a different um, experimental approach to approximate gene expression, so maybe qPCR or something like that. So biological replicates and independent validation of the values through some other experimental mechanism is a really good approach to, to get at whether or not the, these apparently precise estimates have any reality. Okay, so now we're going to get into actually working um, with the data that we have in our, um, in our data frame. So in the previous plot, I had simulated data, x values and y values that start at 0, ended at 1,000 years and then run for 20. Now what we're going to do is actually plot the relationship between the two technical replicates for the control condition. So in that data frame, we've got the one column that is control one, and then the other column that is control two, and each of those columns have counts for every gene. And they are meant to be technical replicates of this sort of mock, mock condition. Um, so if you take that, if you take that uh, command, Notice that the x values here, the first, the first variable is the x, is considered the x. The second variable is considered the y. And actually, a better way of writing our code would be to be explicit about that. I'm setting x to be control 1, and I'm setting y to be control 2. So explicit code is much better than implicit code because you can read it. You're not making any assumptions. You're telling the computer exactly what you want. And so you and your uh, lab mates can look at the code and have a much better sense of what's happening if you're explicit. Okay, so notice we're also using this named column convention. So we're defining x to be control one column. What's another way to, to make the plot use control one column instead of naming it? How else can we reference columns in, in data frames? Number. Right, by number. But by name is obviously a much, a much more explicit and readable uh, choice. Okay. So if we do that, hopefully it works. It didn't work. Uh, so what did I do wrong? Let's see. Oh, I don't think I've loaded it up. I think I'm behind you guys. Or we get to debug something. Yep. Okay. Hold on a second. I have to catch up. We'll get into this code that's above here at the end of the lecture. Oh, whoops, hold on. Okay. So, now we've got this scatter plot again. And for the most part, it, it sort of looks like they're pretty well correlated, although, it's not really right on the diagonal. If they were perfectly correlated, we would expect them to be right on this diagonal. Plus, there's a lot of points way down here. There's so many points, so how, there's probably, how can we figure out how many genes are in this table, in this data, data frame? Anyone remember how you figure out how many rows and columns in a data frame? Dim, yeah, dimension. So let's just figure out. So there's 38,694 genes or rows, observations, in this data frame. Therefore, when we plot this, there are 30, 38,694 points on this plot. 
I can really only see by eye about 40 of them. The rest of them are just smushed down in this corner because most genes, as expected, have RNA counts that are well below 50,000, which is the, the cutoff here. There's some crazy outliers. So here's some, here's some, uh, let me switch back here. I mean, check this point out. So in, in control condition one, there's 250,000 cDNA molecules that align to that one gene, whatever it is. Uh, and what is that? Five and 50,000, it looks like. I don't know, 500,000. I can't read it well enough. But crazy outliers. Whereas everything, most of the data, most of the other 38,000 and change genes have expressions that are much lower and are clustered in this corner. Um, so that's a concept that's known as overplotting. Essentially, you've got so many points that have roughly the same value that you really, you don't have much information about. You can't really pick out any one particular point representing one particular gene. So there's strategies for dealing with that. One thing that you, one concept that you often see is, you know, you make a, you make a first plot with a bunch of points and they're all smushed. And then, you know, you see a dashed line and someone will make like a zoomed in subplot, which is just focusing on this region. So you get much more resolution. Okay, and that's, that's really what we can do now. We can zoom in. So how, what, what does zooming in really involve? What are we doing when we're zooming in? Yeah, we're, we're limiting the range of the axes, right? So we're basically saying, hey, R, don't plot every value, just plot the genes or the rows in this data frame that have x values and y values below some limit. And that limit, um, let me come back to this. Oh, sorry. So how do, the, the trick is how do we define our limit? Um, so one thing we can do is look at the distribution of counts that are observed uh, across all these different genes. So a histogram is a nice way of summary, summarizing how many, how many genes had a, 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 gene, a, a cDNA count between, say, 0 and 100, or 100 and 500, or 500 and 1,000. Um, so if we, if we use this histogram function, H-I-S-T, on the control condition, the first control condition, it'll look at all values, all 38,600 whatever gene counts for the control one condition and figure out what the range of values are and plot them. The, 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 what you can tell though about this pretty quickly is that there's not much information here. The way the, way the histogram works um, when using all the data is that you know, the vast majority of the data as we saw in the scatter plot is well below 50,000. So basically all the data falls into this one bar and then there's some really sad, tiny little bars that you can barely see that you know, go all the way out to 300,000. So when you see a plot like this, you need to work harder. You need to figure out a better way to figure out what the range or the distribution of values uh, is. So last time, or maybe the time before, I can't remember, we learned about this summary function which will tell you the max, the min, the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, and one other thing, uh, mean and median, okay? So if we run that this function on that same, all we need to do is change hist to summary. We're gonna get a summary of that same column. And we get something that I think is, is much more informative. Um, the first, the, the mean value is 546, um, the, and the max is 287,372. So that's that point that's way off on the right of the scatter plot. Um, so using these values, we can get a sense of, well, if we want to see 75% of the data, this is telling us that if we set our x limit to 203, we'll see 75% of the points. What's interesting is that the third quartile is actually lower than the mean, and that's because there's these the crazy outliers that are just massive values that the, 
so this this distribution isn't normally distributed. We haven't talked about that, but you probably have a sense of a bell curve. It doesn't have this nice symmetric shape. So um, now what we can do is set limits. I just arbitrarily chose 2,500, so we're going to see well beyond the 75th percentile, but we're going to zoom in and really restrict, get rid of uh, those outliers and, and be better equipped to actually look at the relationship between the counts observed in technical replicate one versus technical replicate two. So the way you do that is with these options or parameters called xlim and ylim. So basically the, the notion is you use this C concatenate function that we learned before. And we, and we say that the minimum Y value that we want to observe is zero. The maximum Y X value that we want to observe is 2,500. So you can see that now X starts at zero, ends at 2,500. Same for Y, zero to 2,500. So what is, looking at this zoomed in subplot, what's your sense of the relationship between the two replicates? How, how precise are our measurements generally? Good, bad? Hmm? I think I heard pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. <clears throat> Whether the best, they're the best they could be, who knows? But there's there's basically decent correlation. A lot of the points are right on roughly this this 45 degree line, x equal y. Um, but there's also there's a lot there are some outliers. There's I mean consider this 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 gene right here. It had a count of I'd say 150 or 200 in the first technical replicate, but 2,000 in the second technical technical replicate. So if we really want to characterize the expression, if, if that's the one gene that we really care about, we got some problems, right? Because we probably need to do multiple more replicates to get a sense of really what the range of values uh, observed is. But if, if the gene that we're most excited about in the lab is like this guy, that's, we're pretty good. That gene is pretty well expressed in the tissue that we, the cells that we've actually measured, and the estimate that we obtain from RNA-seq is pretty consistent. Whether it's accurate, we don't know. It's precise, though. Okay, um, so one of the things that you can do, I talked about this ideal line, this y equal x or x equal y line. It's often nice to just draw that line on a plot so you have a sense of how much does the, the, the the scatter that I'm seeing really match up with a, the, that ideal correlation. Um, so there's this uh, other function called AD line. We can establish um, the color, and you have two parameters, and I, I haven't coded this terribly well. Uh, it just says zero and one. It doesn't really tell you what they mean. The one means the slope. So this is Essentially, AD line is a function that allows you to do y equal mxd plots. So we set our slope, which is m, to 1, and our intercept, b, is 0. That basically just draws y equal x uh, <coughs> diagonal, and it makes it that nice orange color. Is that, can you see that in the back? Hopefully. But I think what you can, what you can tell is, I'm going to draw, I'm going to hover over that orange line. It's doing pretty well for a while, and then it starts to skew a little bit. And when we get above, say, read counts of 1,000, we start to see this separation where the second technical replicate seems to have more expression for every gene than the first. Why might that be? There's, it's kind of a trick question because there's maybe a 1,000 different answers to that. Um, so a couple things that could be going on. One, um, maybe the conditions for the second technical replicate were more ideal to obtain more data, more cDNA reads. Um, the other, another thing that often happens is our, in RNA-seq is that in the first technical replicate, you put it on the Illumina sequencer and you get 25 million reads. In the second technical replicate, you get 30 million. So the actual total amount of data in the two experiments isn't the same. 
So therefore, if I don't know what 30 is to 25 is, so but uh, what 20% greater, right? So if there's if it's slightly greater in terms of the total amount of data, you're going to see this shift upward shift of the counts observed for technical replicate two versus technical replicate one, not because of any fundamental differences in the biology, but simply because you got more data in the second experiment. So this introduces this notion of normalization. You need to sort of normalize the counts that you observe in the two, two replicates so that you, you're comparing apples to apples rather than apples to oranges because of just different amounts of total data. Does that make sense? There's, there's 999 other reasons why this might be, but one of, the, one of the first things to check is, I'm actually dealing with the same amount of data for the two experiments. If not, you need to do something about that. And we'll talk later about how we do something about that. Um, so, this gets into the notion of uh, differential expression. So, often what we want to know uh, using RNA-seq is We've got an experimental condition, and we've got a mock control condition where we did nothing. Um, or we're comparing sort of a, a, a wild type strain of something to a mutant strain. And often what we're asking with RNA-seq is, which genes expression have changed or different differential between the two conditions? Have they, which have gone up, which have gone down? And I think what you can see just in the technical replicates, the variance in the counts from the technical replicates, we have to be pretty strict about that because if we see subtle differences, even in the technical replicates, we have to be pretty suspicious of very subtle differences in biological replicates, right? Because we know that there's, there's a little noise in the system. The technical replicates tell us that. Um, so, we're going to walk through a, a one, attempt, one way of, of maybe trying to detect differential expression among these two controlled and two experimental conditions. That is not the recommended way. We're going to talk about much more sophisticated methods for RNA-seq uh, later on that, that use some fancy, fancy statistics um, to, to help model the variation that we observe in technical replicates and use that to guide what is significant in terms of the biological replicates. But one crude thing we can do is since we have two, two control conditions and two experimental conditions, um, and we notice in the technical replicates that, you know, by and large they're pretty well correlated, but there's scatter off that ideal 45 degree line, suggesting there's still noise in the system. We could just take the average read count from the experimental condition and the average read count from the two uh, control conditions and compare those. Does that make sense? So essentially what we're doing, because there's noise here, let's take, um, let's take this point. Can you see that dot way in the back? My red pointer. So if we took this point, condition one, it's like 490 or uh, replicate one. And then in replicate two, it's like 900. That's noisy. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the average of those two. So 450 plus 900 divided by two is something like 700-ish, right? So basically we're gonna move the value for the, the average value for the two conditions is gonna be somewhere between the two. So we're gonna do that for every gene for the control condition, and we're gonna do that for every gene in the um, experimental condition, and then we're going to do a scatter plot of control versus experimental to see if there's any evidence of differential expression. But we're using the fact that we've done replicates to average the values observed across those two experiments to minimize the noise when we compare experimental to control. I want to emphasize that this is not the right, this is not the most sophisticated approach. This is just a kind of a crude analysis that Given that we've done our replicates, this is something we could do. It's not something you should do. Okay, so we're going to assign, this, this introduces uh, two new concepts in R. One, we're going to create a new column in our data frame. So, so we started out 
with just these first five columns, gene and the four counts. This command up above creates a new column called control mean. So we say gene counts, dollar sign for uh, column name, control mean. And we have to tell it what values we want to go into that new column that we created. And what we're going to do is take the control one condition um, plus the control two condition and then divide the result by two. So that computes the mean of the two conditions. And what R knows to do is it walks through every row and takes control one value, control two value, adds them up, 723 plus 904, then divides by two. And the mean becomes 813.5. And if you don't trust it, you can plug it into your calculator and that's, that's the right value. Um, the mean of zero and zero is zero. This is, and then it's basically doing that, that same math for every single row in the data frame and applying the result to this new column called control mean. So you might have heard before that um, R is vectorized and, and you might have no idea what that means. I, I still find it a bit weird, but the basic idea is it will take a whole list of numbers, all the numbers in control one column, a whole list of numbers, all the numbers in control two and apply this code to every pair of values in those two columns Without, in other languages, you'd have to write a for loop. You'd have to say for row one, get control one, get control two, create the mean. Control, row two, row three. R just does that for you automatically. Okay, so now we've got um, the mean of the two control experiments. And then similarly, you can do the same thing uh, for the two treated experimental conditions. Um, You'll notice that that first row, the treated mean is NA. And that's because treated value two is NA. So it can't compute the average of a known value and an unknown value. It won't attempt to, it, it won't even guess. All right, so let me, let me catch up and, and add those two columns if you have, guys haven't done it already. Copy and paste these. Okay, and then treated. Now we can use head to look at the first few lines. And lo and behold, I hope, yep, there's this control mean column and treated mean. All right. So now. We can do the same plot, we're doing limiting to the first, uh, to x equal 0 to 2500, y 0 to 2500. But now we're plotting a scatter plot of the control mean, the mean value of those two control experiments, against the treated mean. What do you guys think about this plot? Any comments? Aesthetics? Is it ugly? Does it tell you anything? What does it mean? I'm actually looking for help because I don't really know entirely what it means. But uh, what, what's what's one observation given the uh, the y equal x orange line? What does that tell us? Yeah. So and and what does that mean? Given that x is the control. Y is the treated. Most of the, I think what you're, just to rephrase what you said, I think what you're saying is most of the points are below the orange line. So what does that mean? Control Yeah. For the typical gene, the control mean is higher than the treated mean. So going back to what we saw with the, the, the replicates of the control, what, What's one, what's one possibility that might explain that? One is, the bio, like whatever happened to the treated, maybe we zapped it with gamma radiation or, or you know, nuked it with something. Genes are just not as highly expressed overall. That could be, 
Um, there's a few, I don't know, uh, maybe 200 points above the orange line, rough estimate, maybe 400, I don't know. Um, but by and large, the points are below, so it could be that just globally, expression is down. Maybe, maybe it's some like RNA polymerase mutant where we just don't make RNA transcripts, who knows. Um, it could also be, though, that, again, we just have more data for the control. Whenever, so maybe we did the two control technical replicates on Monday, and that flow cell that was used at the sequencing core on Monday was like the best. And then the one on Friday, when you did the experimental condition, it just was, wasn't as good a flow cell, and you just didn't need as much data. So this makes that, that potential difference just in the amount of data makes differential expression, finding genes that are truly less expressed or truly higher expressed in the experimental condition, very difficult, right? Because basically we, the prior, the prior expectation looking at this plot is that every gene in the experimental condition will be lower. So how could we really trust, you know, essentially when you're doing differential expression, you're, you're testing, there's 38,000 genes, you're doing 38,000 hypothesis tests. You're asking, my hypothesis is the null hypothesis, which we haven't talked about, but you've probably heard of. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference in gene expression between the control and the treated. But for each of the 38,000 genes, when you're doing differential expression, you're saying, is there sufficient, you're asking, is there sufficient evidence that the expression in the experimental condition is fundamentally different than the control condition? And a plot like this tells you that probably without doing any sort of correction, maybe for the amount of total data in the control and experimental conditions, you're going to get a lot of false positive predictions that yes, there's reduced expression. So this, this gets into knowing a little bit about the experimental condition, you know, what, what you're actually testing. Is it a, is it a um, RNA polymerase mutant? Well, maybe you would expect this. But if the only difference between control and treated is slightly different genetic background in a mouse, you might not expect that at all. And that's probably, this is what I would say is a, a diagnostic plot. You're doing, you're comparing these two conditions just to get a sense of like, does the data smell right? Is it, does it make sense? And if it does, then you can move forward with the statistical testing to look for differential expression. But if it looks like this and it doesn't really match up your expectations with the experimental conditions, then you might want to think harder about moving forward with the analysis because there might be a flaw. Uh, okay, so we just walked through what those basic observations are. Um, I, once again, I'm not going to be able to get to our markdown in, in 10 minutes, so we'll save that for another time. Um, but I just want to fast forward uh, quickly to... If you're interested in Markdown, the slides are all here. It's basically just a way to make a reproducible notebook um, that can, you can turn into a PDF or a web page to share with your collaborators. We'll get to this eventually. Um, let me just tell you about a little bit of homework that I would recommend doing um, be before next week. Um, the first is this really nice new paper from uh, Pollard, Pollard, and Pollard. Um, Katie Pollard, who's at UCSF, her brother, I forgot his name, and her dad, I forgot his name. Um, but the three of them wrote this really nice paper that came out maybe a week or two ago, just talking about fundamental concepts uh, in statistical methods for cellu cellular and molecular biology. Um, it has a really nice um, flow chart of what statistical tests to use under different scenarios. Like if you're comparing two means uh, you may know that you typically use a t-test for that. Um, when you get into more esoteric stuff, uh, you know, multiple categories, multiple means, it has, you know, basically asks you questions about your data, yes, no, and you follow a path to get uh, to what would be a recommended statistical test in that scenario. It also talks about, um, recaps some of the, the things I just talked about with precision and accuracy, and also introduces um, some other concepts that uh, I think would be really helpful given where we are in the group. And then um, if any of this uh, is, is still confusing related to how to use data frames, 
um, I would recommend looking at these two videos. Um, they're four and six minutes each. Um, the narrators aren't um, all that enthusiastic, but it's pretty information rich given the four to six minutes. Um, and it's, I think it's a good setup for uh, the lecture that's going to come next week from uh, Javier, who's in the back, um, on, on new uh, other types of variables and data structures and R as well as other things. Um, so just looking ahead, yeah, Javier's next week. That's a week from today. Um, then we're going to take two weeks off. We'll, be, we'll get back onto this every other week cycle. Tom Sassani um, is a grad student in my lab. He's um, become pretty proficient in using R for all sorts of fancy plots. Um, and he's going to introduce a package called ggplot, um, which is a little bit difficult to get to learn initially, but once you force yourself to use it, uh, I think it's an incredibly powerful plotting um, package. And it, and it allows you to do things that are much more difficult to do with sort of the, the native uh, plotting tools in R. Um, <laughs> so we're going to take two weeks off, then Tom, and then Charlie Murtaugh is um, going to teach you some really, really powerful uh, tools called Tidyverse, which allows you to work with data frames and really large, complex data sets in very cool ways. It allows you to filter and sort and subset large, complicated data frames that we typically deal with in biology uh, very easily. And then uh, at the end of July, I'm going to uh, come back and we're going to actually get into sort of fundamentals of statistics. We're going to talk about discrete and continuous random variables and, and basic concepts of probability. Um, I don't know what we're going to do after that, but we'll figure that out as July progresses. Um, and we'll have, to, we'll have to weave our markdown into there somehow. Um, not sure how we'll figure that out. But thanks for coming.